Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving. And can you believe it's not raining for possibly the first time in what feels like several lifetimes? And today we're going to be working on this thing, the Rover P6 V8 4.6. And the intention of this video is to drive away the end actually in this car, mobile under its own power, possibly even with its own wings on, although I did notice some holes in it. So we might not after all, because it wouldn't be Furious Driving without rust. And it's a very old car. So there's some rust I've spotted. So we're gonna be looking at that maybe in the next video because who loves welding? But anyway, the big news is the carport has survived. We had two, <laughs> and two major named storms. Storm something beginning with G and then Storm Hank. Both of them were the kind of thing which had Mrs. Furious saying, it's gonna be coming down. The roof's gonna be in the fields over there by morning. And both times it's been fine. The wind was actually strong enough to tear the straps off the cover underneath this thing. So that's how bad the wind has been the last few days. And something I have realized over the last, well, rainy few days is I need some screen at the back and some screen at the side and maybe a little extension at the front of this thing because although the tops of the cars were staying dry, which is actually a major thing because it keeps the cabins dry, the roof on the MX-5 obviously being an old, a 33 year old, 34 year old convert well, it isn't 100% watertight. It keeps the interiors, it gives the bulk of the car dry, but there's still rain blowing onto them from the front and the back. So I do need to do some additional work, but that's not what this video is about. This video is about making this thing drivable. In the last video, so I'm rambling. In the last video, I was convinced the gearbox wasn't selecting the right gears in the right place on the selector. Looked underneath the car, that seems to be working correctly. So I have acquired some ATFG, so I'm gonna drain contents of the gearbox. It actually takes eight liters of ATF in that thing, which is a lot. That's only a gallon of five liters. Uh, however, the torque converter is gonna contain a lot of fluid. So I think five liters will probably be enough, which I hope it is because it's 25 quid for a gallon of the stuff. Then with the correct amount of fluid in there, I'm hoping it will then select the right gears. And when it revs in neutral, it won't try and fly down the road. I'm also gonna jack up all the corners and see if any of the wheels are binding as well, because that is maybe the reason I can't move the car when it's in neutral. Anyway, right, without further ado, as I believe is the essential thing you have to say on the internet these days. So let's get some fluid into that transmission. However, to make that happen, you have to have the engine running. So let's get some coolant back in the radiator because that's the thing you have to have happening on this car. So yeah, lots of coolant, lots of draining, lots of liquids, and hopefully lots of moving. We shall see. Right, we've now got the car safely supported. Now I do the, because when it comes to jacking up P6s, Lifting a P6 and safe are two mutually exclusive things, generally speaking, because they're not cars that like to be jacked. So we've got the jack underneath the front cross member and we've got axle stands underneath the front suspension because there aren't many places to put them on these cars that are actually gonna support the car if it does decide to fall. However, right now, in order to drain this fluid, what we do, we pop out that drain screw, which is very helpfully at the back of the gearbox. So when the car is jacked up, the fluid will run towards it, which is uh, unusually full of forethought for a car manufacturer. Um, that's quite tight. Insanely tight. I mean, it's been in there for years. Well, I'm not going to call this a solution yet, but I'm using the screwdriver through the hand roll of a screwdriver method to try and get this thing to turn because it does not want to shift. One, oh, here we go. It's free. Cracky. Just took one big thump. And now, so I've got my gloves on because I don't know what is going to come out of this gearbox. Um, suspecting it's not going to be pleasant, whatever it is. Bear in mind, this should be like ruby red and it's going to smell disgusting. Oh, it's fairly dark greyish red, so it could be an awful lot worse. But I'm glad I'm changing because I don't know if anyone put Dextron in this. If I did, it's probably too late anyway, but better late than never, I guess, is a thing probably. I wonder if eight litres or five is going to come out of this. While we're under here, let's just take a moment to admire this glorious, I mean, beautiful stainless steel wire pipe we've got coming down here. 
from the front of the headers. This entire header and wipe up setup was from a really nice guy I found on Facebook who bought it for a P6 project and then changed his direction. It really was the bargain of the entire project. Now while this thing drains down, I will take a moment to quickly say if you like content about ropey old rovers and people fixing cars that most people wouldn't bother with, or silly projects, then please do consider hitting the subscribe button at the bottom of this video. It makes a massive difference, and we're so close to 100,000 subs. Your click makes all the difference. Your click could save a very excitable spaniel from not having the right kind of biscuits that he likes. That sounds like we're reaching the end of our dribbling. It didn't seem like a lot came out to be honest. And the reason not a lot came out will be one of two reasons. Firstly, there wasn't enough in there to start with, which would mean it was struggling to turn and was potentially damaging the gearbox every time we are trying to move the car. Or secondly, there's an absolute load in the torque converter, which is also possible. The only real way to, to properly drain one of these things is to drain the torque converter on the floor. And I don't remember if the torque converter got drained or not when we took it all out. Oh, yeah. Well, apart from being dark and goopy, that looks like nowhere near enough um, transmission fluid. That looks about like half as much as I, I would be needing, which may well be why the car was doing weird things. Now, I know a lot of you get very angry indeed that I don't do things in a very strict order, like one, two, three, follow the list. But, you know, this is how the real world is, unfortunately. Uh, whilst I was lying under the car trying to turn that screw, which is incredibly tight, I did actually just inadvertently turn this wheel. And thought, oh gosh, you know what? That reminds me, I need to go and check all the brakes on this car. Wandered around the other side, seeing as the car is currently jacked up, and guess what? This wheel is so solid, I cannot turn the thing. Jeez. So I think I found the reason that the car doesn't move. It's not the gearbox, it's that wheel. Well, those brakes, in fact. Well, I knew the not raining thing was too good to last because guess what? It's raining, but ha 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 We're underneath the carport, so we're still dry. Anyway, I've filled up the radiator as far as I possibly can without the water pump. Um, I have added this oil catch can just as an emergency overflow, just as a temporary thing because I know it's not a pressurized thing, I'll just leave it with the, the cap off, just as a, a catch for the moment. I do need to go and buy an actual expansion tank, so we'll live with that. Once the engine's up to temperature, we can then start topping up the ATF through the dipstick fluid thing. And what we have to do is run the gearbox through every gear with the car static, obviously, and then once we've got fluid going to all the oil ways, then we can keep on topping up and measuring the distance and seeing if we've bought enough or if we need to go and order another can for tomorrow. I can definitely smell petrol even if it's not firing up, but it does smell like yucky old petrol. A thought has just occurred. I'm hearing a little bit of clicking as it slows down and pressurizes, but I don't think I put any more petrol in this car, so I think I'm gonna need to go and buy some more fuel. There's always something. Now I can smell petrol coming through, but it doesn't smell particularly fresh. So I've unbuttoned the pipe that goes out of the fuel pump into the fuel filter just to see what's coming out of there. And I've got a feeling it's not gonna be good. Oh, that's a very yellow petrol, yikes. <laughs> Oop. Um, yeah, that's, that's smelly and evaporating fast, thankfully, but that does mean I think there's a fair bit of legacy petrol in the fuel lines from the back of the car to the front of the car, which probably has very little burning ability when it reaches the engine. So, um, yeah, probably not a bad idea to let it flush out. I'll find a canister for to, to catch it in. Well, I've just shifted about half a gallon of diseased urine yellow fuel out of this car system. Even though I flushed the tank from the tank itself, there must have been quite a lot still in the pipes to waiting to come out and I guess in the very bottom of the tank as well. So now we've hopefully only got clean fuel in there, but I think what I'll do before I do any more flushing is go and grab a couple more gallons just to dilute anything that's still in there. Right, mission accomplished top up this thing and now we can get back to doing the Rover P6 video which is very different from driving the MX-5 video. It's actual spannering and I think I figured out why I can't push this car up and down the drive. The reason we're using V-Power is because the cleaning elements in it are so good. It makes a wonderful difference to sort of flushing through the fuel system and hopefully these uh, carburetors are now going to be moving freely. And of course, I was very kindly sent in the junk in the trunk, the correct repair thing. So actually, I'll do that quickly as well. I need to do that for our startup time as well. So many things to remember. So thank you to Jeff, who sent through these little uh, outer shake ferry rules for the chokes from, uh, where are they from? g l Carburetor Fuel Systems. This is in the last junk in the trunk. So this desperately needs to go on there. Otherwise, 
well, it's not going to choke properly, is it? We need it to not choke, or to, to actually choke, but choke die, you know, stuff. Right, we have fuel, we have choke. Let's see if this thing will fire up. I need throttle as well, don't I? At least the fuel smells fresher now. Right, I've had a couple of failed attempts to start the car. I assumed it was petrol, so I've disconnected the fuel line variously along this line, and there is fuel getting through. And now I don't seem to be getting a spark, and I don't know why. Randomly annoying. Well, it's a couple of days since the last bit of video you saw in this film because we had snow here. And although it was great, the carport, which is just above shot, did a great job keeping the snow and the elements off the MX-5 and off the Rover, which is fantastic and exactly what it was intended to do. It didn't stop it being really, really cold, like sub-zero. And currently today, it's quite sunny, but it's one degree above freezing and it's lunchtime. So yeah, it's not been the best for getting outside to do work at the moment. However, this will come as no shock to anybody. This is the least surprising bit of news in the history of mankind. This car, which I have to say has always hated me, no longer starts. But I've checked out the fuel system and the fuel system is delivering clean fuel at decent pressure, so that shouldn't be an issue, but there is no spark. I've tried putting the spark plug against the block and turning it. I've tried using a spark I've tried using a spark flashy thing, that didn't work. I've even tried taking the HT lead off the coil and putting it onto the block, no spark there. Then of course I tried changing the coil for a different coil, same results. So this is a fair bit of time of, of just chasing, I don't know what fault. So I'm at slight loss as to what's actually failed. Possibly the electronic ignition module inside the distributor is broken. Possibly there's an earth I haven't noticed has fallen off, but nothing to my knowledge has changed beyond the position of the coil from being close to the engine to being that much further away from the engine, which shouldn't make any difference at all, but apparently it does because now the car doesn't start. And this has become a big source of frustration over the last few days. I'm a bit stuck. <laughs> <laughs> which is it's not fun. So yes, again, this car is just doing its absolute damnedest to beat me for no good reason. I want you to run car, but it doesn't want to run. It's just, mm. So I've dragged it forward on the Freelander, and that means I'm gonna look at that front brake caliper and see if while the engine doesn't start, at least I can make the thing roll by whipping that wheel off, having a look at the caliper and maybe freeing that off, and then making it pushable at the very least. It's better than nothing. Right, so I've pulled the car out to this little gap between the Crown Vic and the garage because hopefully it keeps me out of the wind, which is where the chill is like the most devastating. I don't realize exactly how well this hubcap had been pushed on because really it was quite hard to get off. The red wheels are very Marmite choice. I did it because I'm into hot rods and a little hot rod thing back in the day. There we go. And I thought it looked pretty cool. No one agreed it turned out though. Let's get the wheel off and see what we're dealing with over here. Wow, that is a crusty old cow. Heavy on the cobwebs, crikey. Can you be uh, cobweb bound in a brake caliper, I wonder? It's been a few years since that wheel's been off. This is interesting times. Uh, the bolts that hold the caliper on the back of the wheel hub actually look like, well then, don't know what they actually have, got little uh, lock tabs on them, which makes it all the more interesting. I just wonder if I can undo these things with the uh, ugga dugger or not. Wow, yeah, phew. Wow. That was easier than I expected. So do I need to, oh, it's a long time since I've taken a P6 caliper off. I've kind of forgotten. Oh, it's got a hard line into it as well. So the flexi goes to the um, upright and the hard line goes to the caliper. That's interesting. Do I have to undo that as well? God, it's, I should look at the book really, shouldn't I? And look at that though. That is 100% gripped to the disc. That's why the car won't move, not because of the gearbox after all. I might concentrate on the pins and try and get the pads out because that will make life easier. So the pins are held in well, basically by little, um, little split pins. In theory, <laughs> it should be quite easy to knock them out. Wrong, wrong thing. Easier if I hit the right thing. Oh, 
Wow, that's uh, a little crusty. I'm glad I put some uh, fluid on that to loosen them off. I know some people don't like it when the start of a video is one thing and then we pivot onto something different, but currently I could spend a lot more time chasing down an elusive electrical fault and get nothing done, or I could achieve something because at least I know what I'm doing. Well, kind of know what I'm doing with this. Ow, oh, that's frozen in there. I need a bigger drift. Okay, once we're moving, it's okay. Yeah, that's again, pretty rusty. So those, those locking pins will need cleaning up before they go back into the car, obviously. But let's see if we can get these pads out of there. Hmm. Okay, so I've had a look at the instruction book, the Haynes manual, to sort of see how this thing works. And what I've done, taking out those two big bolts at the back, should have freed it off. I and mean, technically you meant now to uh, undo the hydraulic pipe. So I was gonna just if I can loosen it with that in place still or not. So big hammer, obviously. Uh-huh. And that's just... No, I'm gonna have to undo that. I'm getting flex in the hard pine. This is something I'm going to regret doing because it means now I'm going to have to bleed the entire brake system, which is something I don't want to do. Oh, it's just piddling out fluid already. Oh, this is not good. What a stupid system. I'm going to tie it back up again because, oh. Oh, we're free. Oh, God, that metal pipe does need coming off. Oh, dear me. Okay, I'm gonna have to bleed the brakes. That's something I did not want to do. You know, you're trying to avoid doing something because you know it's gonna be a pain, but you just know ultimately you're never gonna have another solution to it. So, or can I? Can I use a brake clipper on that? Hold on. I've got this thing. I'm gonna see if I can squeeze this into between the, the spring winds on here and clamp this cable off so I don't lose too much fluid. I need bleeding out anyway, but I like it to keep on working. Yeah, yeah, got it. Excellent. That's a good idea. Well done me for remembering stuff that I should do anyway. What I am impressed at is how easily this is winding out. I mean, you can tell sort of quality materials when you find them because this is 1973. That bit of um, fitting went in there. Well, was made anyway. There we go. So the pads, are loads of meat on them. The book actually says, as soon as you knock those pins out, you should be able to just slide these things out easily. Oh, look at the, look at the shape on that. Do I need new front discs as well? Oh yeah, the chamfer is insane. But does this now turn easily? Yep, it really does. So do I need a whole new caliper is the question. This is a, now can I wind this back in? Oh, I'll tell you what, the rubber is actually a bit split looking at this. I didn't notice that before. These rubber bushes, oh, they're crusty as anything. Oh, they're breaking the touch. So this caliper needs a full rebuild at the very least. Actually, so this gets worse and worse. The more I look at it, the worse I guess. So knock this rubber off and look at the state. Oh, it just falls apart of that piston. Rusty as anything. I mean, I don't know what state it was in when the car got parked a lot of time ago, but yeah, it's not great now, is it? I'm thinking I need a new caliper for this, which I'm thinking also probably not cheap. So a new caliper, new disc, new pads. I'm gonna try one more time to, to crank that in. Just because I'm curious now. I'll try to do this without pouring brake fluid down myself. Wow, okay. I cannot move that. That is utterly, utterly rock solid. I'm in no chance. Damn. So this, this is why I couldn't push the car. Well, at least I've found a solution to that. I'll pop the wheel back on now. I'll cover that end of that pipe up with some plastic, uh, or as the old Haynes manual suggests, use a bit of rag, clean rag, of course, not heathens. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll cover that up, put the wheel back on, and then we'll see if we can actually push this car again, because if we can just push it backwards and forwards without the wheel being locked on solid, that would be amazing. Oh, wheel back on, and guess what? Spins now. Well, there's a novelty. Incidentally, as I say this every time, these big old axle stands and the big old jack are all available 
on the Amazon affiliate market store, which really does make a massive difference to keeping this channel afloat. I will leave these clampy grips on the brake cable for the time being, because at least that means I can actually uh, not lose my fluid. Handbrake's off, it's in neutral. Previously, I could not push the car for love and money. It took two of us shoving like crazy. Quite easy now. I mean, I'm saying easy, this is a heavy car, and I'm on my own, it's not even ground, but that is now actually mobile, which it wasn't before. Well, I thought I'd better quickly uh, just pop the other wheel off just to have a quick looky-loo and see what kind of state the front passenger side is in. And look at that, we've got ourselves, it's spider webby, but it's a new caliper on this side, so I'm guessing it was having front brake problems on both sides, but only one of them got replaced. This disc, interestingly, also has a chamfer on it, so I wonder if that is just how they came. So maybe I don't need to replace those discs and pads after all, but I definitely 100% do need to change that other brake caliper, which I'm gonna be expecting to be quite expensive. Let's go find out what one of those will cost. Well, I've had a quick check online and a front caliper for this thing is 75 quid, which is a lot better than I was actually expecting. It's 60 pounds exchange, but you get the money back and it's 75 pounds at the end. That's actually surprisingly good value for a big reconditioned caliper with three pistons in it. And I did look at doing a recon option on it, but that's 52 pounds, which is only 20 quid less. And looking at the state of those pistons, I can't imagine those piston bores are going to be any good at all when it comes to, to salvaging them. So I think a new professionally recon one is going to be the way to go. However, it is January and that's a little bit spendy when things are quite this January at the moment. So we'll hold off for a couple of days until the next payday comes around. So this, anyway, we've got to the point where I think we now know that the gearbox is probably okay. Can't start the car, but can push the car. So it's progress of a sort, you know, one step forward, one step back kind of a way. I think we're gonna have to stop saying things have gone hub nut and start saying things have gone furious because this does seem to be, unfortunately, the way of things sometimes. <sighs> Never mind, this has only been a week of faffing around with a car that doesn't want to play. As I said earlier, this car hates me. I'm pretty sure this car has always hated me because it's just never wanted to play. Some cars just do. It's unfortunate, but then them's the brakes. Anyway, as always, like, subscribe, blah, 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 blah. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again very soon. Like I said, driving something completely different, probably just hitting this thing with a hammer.